And thank you for joining us. I'm Linda Barrett and I am with the Fort Worth Public Library and we are here this morning for TCU Center for Texas Studies Community History Workshop Series. And um, I hope that everybody is doing well today. Uh, one thing I would like to call your attention to, it was just in the video that we played is on Thursday, the 14th of January at 7 p.m. Archivist Jennifer Broncato will be presenting Saving Your Memories in the 21st Century, Personal Digital Archiving. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Leanna Schooley from TCU. Thank you, Linda, and good morning, everybody. Um, I understand that we have a uh, record-breaking crowd this morning, so if some of you hear from friends that um, they were not able to get into our Zoom, uh, you can uh, you can let them know that that it's a licensing issue uh, that we're experiencing. My own graduate assistant is not able to get in this morning, I just learned. So uh, we apologize for that. And, and I will go ahead and take this opportunity to tell you that if you are not able to get in, uh, this program will be archived and available on the library's YouTube channel. We'll include that link in the chat here in a few minutes. And seven to 10 days from now, when they have a little chance for editing, then you'll be able to watch this program. And we apologize for any inconvenience. Um, of course, you have joined the Preserving Our Past workshop series that we put on with the library. Uh, I want to mention that we uh, are able to do this and bring in speakers like uh, Gary Pinkerton, who's with us today, through the generosity of the Summerfield G. Roberts Foundation and the Summerlee Foundation. Uh, our next program will be on February the 6th. Uh, it will be Tawana Steptoe. She is a, a Houston historian who will speak on expanding the archive, hidden histories of race in Houston. So if you are doing um, African-American history and want some hints for creative resources, this will be the program to attend. She is an expert in digging up jewels of history from obscure sources. Um, I also wanna tell you that if you wanna learn more about uh, Texas history in general, as well as what we are, the programs that we are doing, be sure to follow us on Facebook or on Instagram. Uh, we provide a lot of additional information there. And uh, with that, I want to introduce our speaker for today. Uh, he is independent researcher Gary Pinkerton, who specializes in East Texas. He was brought to our topic today because Trammell's Trace, in fact, crosses some family property. And so a little research turned into the book, uh, uh, Trammell's Trace, The First Road to Texas from the North. Uh, now, Gary is a, a contributor to the Handbook of Texas. He is also the author of True Believers, Treasure Hunters at Hendricks Lake, and has other projects ongoing right now. But today, we are going to uh, take a tour down the uh, Trammell's Trace with Gary. And with that, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Dr. Schooley and uh, Linda. Thanks to the library for hosting this. I'm sorry I wasn't able to make the trip and, and present in that beautiful auditorium, but this is a great way to reach uh, more people and to uh, be able to get things going. Um, if you'll let me uh, share my screen now, I'll get on with the program. Trammell's Trace, I call it the first road to the north, uh, to Texas from the north, because in the earliest time period of, uh, of Anglo settlement in Texas, the El Camino Real that ran east-west uh, through Nacogdoches and Trammell's Trace were about the only things close to what might be called a road. So I'm calling, uh, participating from Houston and live here. So I want people to understand a little bit more about the history of roads and trails uh, in general before we talk about Trammell's Trace in particular. So when I talk about the first road to Texas from the north, it's important that people realize that we're we're not talking about excuse me we're not talking about Interstate 45. 
the road to the north uh, that I'm talking about goes much farther back in history, back to what some people would call pre-civilization, which was before Bucky's. So the road we're going back is much farther back in time than that. When you think about roads, it's important to understand that we have to get out of what our current concept is. Uh, things change with bulldozers and even with road graders that could be pulled behind a mule. Roads follow the terrain and it was easy to figure out where roads went by looking at topographic maps. And we have to understand that humans and animals have been leaving trails for a long time. And even this box turtle walking through some wet grass is leaving a trail behind him. You'll see several quotes today from this uh, book uh, by Robert Moore, who uh, gets very philosophical about roads um, and talks about how important they are to uh, human history. He points out that we're born to wander, but that everyone who comes before us has left a trace for us to follow. And it's part of that history that leads to uh, Trammell's Trace existence. Deer trails through the woods uh, are easy to follow. Bison trails leave a, an even bigger mark, but animals could be relied on to find the easiest path to get across rivers or through difficult terrain. Buffalo trails uh, were followed by people, not only for food, but for uh, navigation to find places to watering holes or to river crossings. Those Native Americans followed those uh, bison uh, on regular hunts for food and for clothing and for shelter. Uh, and the trading trails that they developed cross over hundreds of miles. Uh, archaeologists find stone in Texas sites that exist only hundreds of miles away. And so these extensive trading trails uh, have been in existence for a long time. You can always count on animals to find a way somewhere. This is a great picture, uh, animal routes on the right and left and a human route who had a different destination uh, in the middle. In the 1500s, when Spanish explorers started arriving to Texas, they didn't blaze new trails. They didn't invent roads. They co-opted them and used Indian guides who even themselves got lost as they crossed around the terrain. Uh, the book I'm working on now is, covers some of that period and the diary notes about the Entradas with 300 horses and 800 goats and 200 people uh, are just difficult to imagine crossing the early terrain in Texas. Some of those paths, uh, even though they weren't used more than a few times, were not abandoned and they began to be used in the early 1800s by Anglos uh, smuggling horses from the Red River prairies down to New Orleans or to Natchez and then began to be used extensively primarily by Tennesseans in 1821 and prior to find a way down to Stephen F. Austin's colony. So I, I get on my soapbox a little bit uh, about roads because I have been working on this understanding this concept that I call paying history forward. And using my own personal experience as a starting point, I asked the question, how do we get people involved in history? What engages them uh, to become involved in a particular thing? For genealogists, it's a family history. Uh, and for me, it was a physical feature uh, across the land that we own in Russ County. But paying history forward to me means helping to create personal connections for people uh, to events and uh, and places in the past by making them relevant somehow. What What is it that makes this matter uh, to us now? So I wanna enter that, uh, that concept by just talking about uh, where I started. And this is a, a, a photo uh, in 2004, my father just happened to randomly mention that Trammell's Trace crossed through some property where we played uh, growing up uh, we can sit on the porch of the, of the house we have there and look out at this road rut through the pasture. This 
this part of the trail has been widened by becoming a county road as well. But that serendipitous mention of Trammell's Trace after I was, uh, you know, 50 years old, uh, changed a lot of things for me and led to my, my interest and curiosity. So where we start, particularly if you live in Texas, is that we have to overcome a lot of myth and legend about history. So the Texas of Davy Crockett and the Alamo and Coonskin Haps is certainly not the whole story, but it's the one where we get stuck sometimes. And so looking back at uh, how to understand history before that period is sometimes difficult for cultural reasons uh, as much as anything else. Um, I had one thing in my favor, and that was my uh, lifelong uh, diagnosis as being terminally curious. And so the only treatment for that disease is of course, uh, Google. So when I started Googling to learn more about Trammell's Trace in 2004, uh, there was a lot of myth and legend to work through, not a lot of factual information. Uh, there was one archive in Southwest Arkansas. And uh, as those moments in personal history are, I remember exactly where I was when I got a call back from them to tell me, yes, indeed, they did have the, some collection some, and some early research. So the serendipitous understanding of Trammell's Trace and the curiosity uh, would have gone away years ago, if not for some persistence, which my mother would be uh, better able to explain. And persistence in the research field means that you visit a lot of places that look like this. And uh, as Dr. Schooley will attest, I'm sure uh, this one is very well organized. They don't always look this great. And not only do you have to get to the archive and find your way through what's there to the tiny little tidbits that you want, but you have to make friends with archivists to do that because history, as this quote points out, is not what really happened, but it's what archivists will share with you when they answer your letters and emails. So uh, the world and archives and county courthouse basements and uh, Texas General Land Office is, uh, is certainly uh, difficult, but uh, rewarding. Part of the research for this road had to do a lot with the original Texas land service surveys that are uh, available through the Texas General Land Office. They're thankfully online. They are uh, PDFs that you can use computer tools to zoom in and read, but they're all in this script. And on the scale of handwriting, this is up in the uh, probably a nine out of 10. And there are a lot of fours and fives that are very difficult to read. But sometimes those surveys where the trail existed would have field notes that pointed out exactly where Trammell's Trace crossed the boundary of a land survey as it does in this plat. My early research, I learned that uh, about the El Camino Real and, and had heard of that before. And most people in East Texas, I think had passing through Nacogdoches, uh, Nacogdoches uh, down to Mexico. Uh, it became a National Historic Trail probably about 12 years ago now. Yeah, but it was east-west, and the road that I was looking for was north-south. And I was able to learn that there had been previous roads through that same route, the, the Caddo or the Hassanai Has Trace. Uh, this road wove down through the Caddo Confederacies that made up East Texas civilization uh, uh, as early as 800 uh, AD. What it led me to was finally an understanding that Trammell's Trace was the first northern route for immigration to Texas from Arkansas, Missouri, Kentucky, and Tennessee. And I'll tell people who ask if your ancestors came to Texas uh, from that direction, uh, particularly prior to um, 1836, then they probably came down uh, Trammell's Trace on their way to Nacogdoches and then south and west into the Stephen F. Austin's colony into the, the fast growing uh, parts of Texas. Uh, I learned that uh, famous Texans 
had made their way down that path, Bowie and Crockett and Houston uh, on their way uh, into Texas had used Trammell's Trace. And even though it horrifies my mother, I still say that my real epiphany was learning that Sam Houston uh, might have taken a leak on the property in front of our house. That's how <laughs> that's how my mind works. But it was that realization that uh, turned me into a rut nut. And rut nuts are those of us who uh, are searching out old roads and finding out as much information as we can. And it's a quite a community uh, in East Texas and, and elsewhere. Before I talk about the road a little bit more, I want to talk about Nicholas Trammell, the man for whom the road is named. Uh, there are, I think, 15 national historic trails in the United States and only two are named for people. So for the trail to be named after Trammell meant that it was associated with him by his use for early smuggling and for uh, the history that and the role that he played in that early East Texas history. Uh, his birthday is this Wednesday, 1780, uh, born in near Nashville, Tennessee. His father was a signer of the Cumberland Compact before he was killed uh, in a skirmish with Indians over a stolen deer. Uh, where they lived was right along the border between uh, Kentucky and Tennessee in Logan County, which was called Rogues Harbor, quite a name for uh, a settlement. But it tells you a little bit about the, the family background. They were traders and horsemen uh, and gamblers. There's a lot of myth and legend associated with Nicholas Trammell, but there, uh, as I learned, are factual clues as well that tell us more about uh, who he might have been. Uh, Based on the, the stories and documented history, we know that he was a horse smuggler. His first public mention was in 1813, accused by some very well-respected Cherokee chiefs for stealing horses along with his half-brother. Uh, he was a gambler uh, racing horses uh, in the Nacogdoches archives for the brief period that he was in that area. Uh, a well-documented race uh, for a pig that uh, Trammell and his son were involved in. And it, reading those first two things, this story would may not surprise everybody. Uh, he was also a Methodist. His wives and his family members were well-documented uh, Methodist and preachers uh, in early Arkansas and along the Red River. Uh, those early Methodist preachers were making their way to uh, convert souls. Nicholas Trammell's personality was quite interesting. And my, my education's in... Uh, social work and psychology and so and, and had a career in re human resources so paying attention to people is ingrained for me and trying to understand Nicholas Trammell's personality from what we can learn from documentation about it had been interesting and when I found this quote it affirmed what I'd really understood this quote is from uh, soldiers in 1846 who used Trammell's help to guide them into Texas. And one of the soldiers said that Trammell would perform with fidelity and honor whatever he undertook, but it was prudent to watch him after he completed his engagement. Uh, it sounds like the relatives that you invite over for Thanksgiving dinner, but you count the silver after they leave, right? Also this painting uh, and several of the paintings and presentation are from an artist uh, named David Wright. And, the time period and the description of uh, the physical description from the same soldier of Trammell with his gaunt face and Trammell relatives who've seen this picture and commenting that it looks just like their, their relatives uh, gives us a good idea of what he might have looked like in the early 1800s. That's the time frame he was smuggling horses from the Red River. He was certainly not one to capture the horses. Uh, he was more likely trading uh, hard goods with uh, the Indians uh, in exchange for those horses. He was, uh, and other Tennesseans that had made their way to the Red River uh, uh, at Pecan Point uh, were among the earliest immigrants uh, who began to make their way down Trammell's Trace to Nacogdoches and into Austin's colony in that 1821 uh, migration. He was credited as being the first to widen the trail from Pecan Point, meaning there already was one, with chopping axes and hatchets that allowed people to get down the road uh, with livestock and wagons and more than just horses. That's the 
best representation of what a chopping ax might look like. Pecan pointers in general and trammel in particular were uh, not very highly regarded by Stephen F. Austin. In fact, this quote from Austin said that called out trammel by name and said that these unwanted immigrants included Nicholas Trammell and another Nacogdoches resident named William English, where, where Austin had stayed on his first night in Texas across the Sabine. But Austin said that all the world proclaims these men as criminals uh, and bad men. So that Trammell, some pecan pointers were allowed to settle the colony, but Trammell was not. So he moved just outside the colony on the Trinity River there to some land granted him by Hayden Edwards, uh, failed impresario who made a lot of people angry in Nacogdoches and kicked off the Fredonian Rebellion in 1826. As part of that precursor to that rebellion, Trammell and his family were evicted from land that they were improperly given. And they returned all the way back up into Arkansas where uh, through the end of his life, uh, 1856, his, he and his sons ran taverns, gambling houses, uh, a horse race in 1836 for $2,000 was advertised in the Arkansas Gazette. So let's talk a little bit now about how he came to be and how he got here. And if you're coming to Texas uh, in that early 1800s time period, you crossed uh, Arkansas. The Southwest Trail or the old military road crossed the uh, Arkansas diagonally, essentially along the same route as Interstate 30. And that's because these are mountains on this side and plateaus on this side, and it's a natural place for that route to follow. Uh, old Washington, Arkansas was the center of the universe in Southwest Arkansas and really the last dropping off point in what was uh, the United States uh, and uh, after the uh, Louisiana Purchase. Trammell first settled in Arkansas up near Batesville in 1807. And uh, after 10 years on some land, gained uh, a patent to that. And later on moved down into Hempstead County and had a tavern at what was in a very important crossroads uh, with his son setting up east-west along this road from uh, Pecan Point uh, over to uh, Camden. Trammell's Trace proper connected with uh, the Southwest Trail at Fulton, which is where the Red River takes a sharp 90 degree bend. Uh, and if you drive through uh, the interstate there, you'll cross very near that, uh, right at that Great Bend. The Great Bend of the Red River was, uh, had long time animal crossings, uh, wagon crossings up the river where the Little River came in and created shoals. There were later ferries up and down the river at Fulton and Dooley's Ferry downstream. This 1863 Civil War era map is a great representation of what Fulton looked like at that point. It had been reached by steamboats at that point and people of course thought it was gonna be a great commercial center uh, for cotton, but you can see the, the uh, Ford at low water and the ferry with a little oar sticking out beside it where they crossed uh, at Fulton. The dappled ground is that crusty uh, beach that forms on the inside of a river bend that once the crust is pierced, they said that horses could sink up to their haunches in the, in the mud beneath it. This map maker uh, came up with a very tactful word, I thought, for the roads that followed on the Texas side of the Red River there. Uh, he just labeled it impracticable. I think there are some roads in East Texas still could be labeled that way. What made it impracticable was largely this. There were seven miles of river cane, 30 feet tall, documented on the Texas side of the Red River. And this, this woodcut does more than anything I've ever found to explain what some of these early journeys were by. It's, it's dark through that tunnel. Moving on southwest down Trammell's Trace, the, you came to the south, the Red River Prairies. This is a view of what they call the second flood plain, looking back to the south. Uh, and Trammell's Trace ran across that ridge uh, right there. Uh, it's well documented on the map of the 1841 boundary survey with the US uh, between marker mound 102 and 103 and followed the edge of that river bottom uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, 
crossing through Bowie County, coming to the Sulphur Fork of the Red River, Epperson's Ferry was a, a well-known crossing. This, this uh, picture from that crossing was where horses and people would have crossed to the shoal. Uh, Jim Bruceth and others, uh, the Texas Historical Commission believe Muscoso used this crossing in the 1500s. And just downstream from there, the, the remains of the ferry crossing uh, across the Sulphur River. Through those river bottoms, uh, some of the early uh, travel histories of coming to Texas were like Chamber of Commerce readings, but they came with warnings sometimes. And you see this in river bottoms sometime if the water gets up, there are little oases of land where they warned that these deadly reptiles unknown in the prairies were ready to uh, create instantaneous death. We all know those snakes too well. Farther south, uh, just of the south of the uh, Sulphur River crossing, Trammell's Creek connected with that route from Pecan Point that uh, Trammell had helped open up. Uh, on my website on trammelstrace.com, there's a place that you can download uh, this full map uh, as a PDF to see the whole route of the trace. The solid line, because we know that route pretty well from the survey calls in the uh, original Texas land surveys, but the Spanish trace is a dotted line because it's not as well documented uh, because it wasn't surveyed as, as early but uh, they came together at a place that came to be called Old Unionville. From that point, the trace continued uh, more to the, on an easterly route across uh, Marion County and into uh, Jefferson, uh, south of Jefferson, crossing the Big Cypress and Little Cypress bayous. Uh, and if you look at, when you see the full map of the trail, you'll see that it makes a strange curve to the east before heading south. And, that was because of the Caddo villages that were in that area and the fact that this road was uh, began its use as a, a Caddo trace uh, originally. At the point where Harrison County, Russ County and Panola County touch on the Sabine River is Ramsdale's Ferry. Uh, it has its own wonderful history, but this shoal across the Sabine was been in use for centuries because of uh, what you see here, that's a very hard shelf of lignite coal uh, that provided a, an outcrop and you could drive a truck across that base of that lignite coal. So getting a wagon across was, was no big deal. Uh, just south of there, uh, related to, the, to my second book that uh, Dr. Schooley mentioned was a Hendricks Lake, an oxbow of the Sabine, about three quarters of a mile long where Lafitte treasure became actively sought after uh, in the 1880s and was the subject of a History Channel episode uh, only a few months ago. The road south of the Sabine from uh, followed what became two thirds of the boundary between Rusk and Panola County. So Trammell's taste was that prominent even up to the 1840s that like a river or a, a stream it was defined as the boundary. Uh, the traveler's guide said that it was the most agreeable route from the US and much better than coming in on the Okamanya Rail from Natchitoches uh, to Nacogdoches. And Nacogdoches, of course, was the center of the universe. There wasn't much around there. Uh, it had been abandoned during the time of the filibusters and the Gutierrez McGee expedition and began to be resettled as Spanish Texas and later Mexican Texas, the stone house uh, built by Antonio Gili Barvo uh, was there. So that's the route of the trace. And so back to my original question of paying history forward, what difference does it make now? And my easy answer is that there are ruts. There are still remains of this road crossing the landscape uh, entirely on private land, except for some land at the sulfur that's a Corps of Engineers related to Wright-Patman Lake. But being able to locate this road has been a, a side effort uh, all along and continuing to this day. The, the methods used for that uh, 
are built around a combination of old documents and new technology. And using the general land office surveys, I'm able to mark exactly where the surveyor said Trammell's Trace Cross. This is uh, the Joseph Fields survey. This is Interstate 20 through Marshall, if you're familiar with that. And just south of there, in that particular area, there are five different survey calls where we know that Trammell's Trace existed at the time of the survey. Um, the measurements in the survey, survey were in Spanish varas and converting those to feed and using this mapping software that I have, I'm able to lay in the known parts of the route and use the terrain and the topography uh, to make guesses about where else uh, it might have gone in between and have done that for, uh, you know, roughly 200 miles of Trammell's Trace. More recently, uh, LIDAR, uh, which is a, a type of a sonar, is able to scan the ground and basically eliminate all the vegetation. This is uh, a LIDAR of our family farm. The house is about right there. The picture of the rut that I showed you is right there. And you can see along that yellow line, the features that are visible only on the ground and completely covered by trees uh, and use that to help guide some of the uh, tracking of the trace. Even before that, before LIDAR became widely available, satellite images uh, through the software that I use and Google Earth would show shadowy depressions just like this when I move the line a bit um, between two of those known points up in Cass County. And when we were able to work with landowners and visit and find ruts like these crossing across a pasture between two known points exactly where the road would be, it's pretty exciting. And what's exciting about it is not just the discovery, but the fact that those landowners now have their own stories about Trammell's Trace and a deeper connection to the to their own personal stories of history. When I was there, this uh, young man on the left was uh, probably nine or 10 years old. And I told him the story about Sam Houston that I told you. And I'm pretty sure he went to uh, Hugh Springs Elementary the next day and told his schoolmates how Sam Houston, you know, on his land. So over the years, I've trammeled, uh, traveled from uh, top to bottom on Trammell's Trace uh, multiple times. You don't know how much I wanted to steal that sign uh, right there on Trammell Creek, just east of Washington, Arkansas, and been able to find ruts and visit uh, with landowners all up and down. These are uh, some significant ruts on the right and a bit of a double on the left. This one was along the Rust Panola County line and has been uh, destroyed by uh, lignite mining in the area. Sometimes roads, ruts like this, you really wouldn't notice. It's a little too straight, it seems, but it's exactly where the county line was. And so later uses may have altered it, but it's still part of the remains. This to me is one of the most dramatic. It's just uh, west of Avenger, uh, right along a county road. Uh, where you can see it. And these are double ruts are near Redwater uh, in Cass County as well. Uh, wider ruts uh, along the route, uh, sometimes like our family ruts get turned into county roads. Uh, but a lot of times you'll see the narrower ruts just off of these wider ruts that go that get co-opted. One of my principles is that new roads follow old roads until the bulldozers show up. So once a bulldozer can cut a simpler path, roads are gonna follow the terrain and uh, they may have been straightened out, but they're gonna be along the same corridor. Uh, this one in Cass County near Dalton Church, Naples area was clearly not a county road. Uh, I like this one in Hughes Springs because there's there's the rut, just, as, just on the east side of Hughes Springs actually had some bamboo growing and I begged them not to cut it. And then one of the more recent finds was a landowner who had property along the Little Cypress west of Jefferson. And we monitored flood gauges for a couple of months before the water got low enough for us to see how these rocks had been laid across the creek exactly where the road would have been and clearly done before that 
gigantic cypress tree uh, was uh, was there. So places like this where crossings have been improved uh, are just incredible. And the, the size of the trees in that bottom were amazing. We found this crossing completely using those mapping methods. I've had a known point north and a known port south and follow the terrain at, to here. And when meeting with the landowners, we went there this crossing across the creek had been made and used for a long time. This was another one that was visible easily from satellite photos. The trees and brush and briars grew in that, in that rut because it couldn't be mowed easily. And so that rut glowed uh, on the maps uh, like you wouldn't believe. And then along the Rust Panola County line at Martin Creek Lake, these ruts still exist and along the County Line Road, which generally took a straight route, Trammell's Trace would have crossed it zigzagging uh, just like that. Traveling the roads of East Texas, uh, of course, you get to meet some interesting people along the way. This, I uh, never got this person to speak to me at all, but uh, it was just down the road from a house with a couple of hogs and dogs laying in the yard. Uh, I've been some interesting places. I'm happy to say I was able to get out of them. And then just had some incredibly wonderful days uh, like this where unexpected snowfall uh, just created some beautiful scenery. So the future of Trammell's Trace uh, is an interesting question. And with any feature that exists on the ground and on private land, it's, you know, it's at its peril. Um, it was interesting a few years ago when Governor Rick Perry proposed the, the Texas Transportation Corridor, a big swath of right of way north to south or east Texas, it essentially followed the same route. So bulldozers can show up anytime, clear cutting makes it difficult to get through there. But one of the more significant uh, threats and, and already completed to Trammell's Trace was along that county line in Ruskin Panola in Harrison County. County Line Road was blocked off because lignite mining like this was uh, beginning all up and down uh, that route and along the county. So just for some perspective, that little white speck right there is a human. Uh, these cranes are ginormous. A couple of pickup trucks would fit inside those buckets. And so there are sections of Trammell Trace that look exactly like that uh, right now. They dig it up, they take the coal out, they sift, sift it and put it back. And it's, it's the reclamation projects are very impressive. They're planted and sculpted, but there's not a topographic map anywhere that matches uh, what the terrain does. And I, I call it a bit of a playland because it's been sifted and put back in place. The good news from that is that there were required archeological surveys done and that red is the permitting that's been done for mining. And it just, it's like it almost have couldn't been worse for the existence of Trammell's Trace along that route. You can see how many miles of the trace has been uh, dug up and mined and put back together. But as I said, the good news is that required a lot of archeological surveys and those triangles are where surveys have been done. So we've learned a lot about the early Cherokee and Caddo uh, settlers in those areas and even some of the later Anglo uh, as well. So since that first time I Googled uh, Trammell's Trace, uh, there's a few things that are sticking. And, you know, if persistence is worth something, I guess this is the reward that when I Google Trammell's Trace back then, there was a lot of uh, myth and legend and questions. Uh, and if you Google it today, you, you've got to scroll a bit before you get past me. I'm sorry, but uh, uh, there's a lot out there and available and, and the activity, particularly since the book came out in uh, a few years ago that uh, continues. Uh, Trammell'sTrace.com is a website I put up a couple of years ago. Uh, and try to maintain pretty much as a fixed repository of information. But in the orders tab there, uh, I would invite you to order my books, please. 
Yeah, but you can also download a, a free PDF map of uh, Trammell's Trace in its entirety. Links to the to Facebook, to other events, uh, and a lot of other good stuff is there as well. There's also a Trammell's Trace uh, Facebook group where ongoing conversation about what's happening now, pictures from the field, new landowners, uh, Trammell descendants uh, get together to talk about the road in the present tense. Uh, a few years ago, 2017, uh, Logan Hope, who's, who was a student at Stephen F. Austin back then, entered a poster of Trammell's Trace in the Texas GIS Forum, Forum GIS's Geographic Information System, and in a competition against professionals and archaeologists and general land office employees, uh, his map won first place. So that's pretty cool. Uh, there's the full copy of the PDF map. It's a 11 by 17. If you buy a book from me, I stick one in the front cover. But a digital version of that map is also on the website and connects you to the map on Google Maps. You can turn on this map on your phone, set it up on the dashboard of your car as you drive through beautiful East Texas, and the map will alert you when you're getting near or crossing uh, the route. It's it's pretty cool. Uh, and there's a connection to the website uh, for that as well. Uh, the map is also on the portal to Texas history. Um, I'm assuming everybody on earth should know about the portal to Texas history, but I'm surprised that's not true. It is one of the most incredible resources uh, ever for anybody like us looking for history. And so the map is there and can be downloaded there as well. Uh, it's also nice to see things happening that I didn't cause, like the Texas Historic Sites Atlas. I logged in there one day and noticed that they had used my mapping to lay in Trammell's Trace and the El Camino Real as, as historic trails along the terrain. Uh, so that's pretty. That's pretty neat. I like that. Uh, Trammell's Trace uh, have also updated the Handbook of Texas entry to make it more accurate and um, and current. And the Encyclopedia of Arkansas also has a mention of Trammell's Trace. Since we started all this research with some fellow rut nuts, one of those uh, uh, original rut nuts was Bob Vernon, who's a Texas Historical Commission archaeological steward in Cass County, Marion County. Uh, he took this picture when we found these two ruts crossing across a pasture uh, right on Highway 77. And this historical marker was erected in uh, 2006, the first one since the more current research has been done. There uh, is a US bicentennial marker, a Texas centennial marker and five other Texas historical markers related to Trammell's Trace. And other than this one, they all have some of those errors of fact or myth that get in the way of, of the real good story. Uh, Martha Fleetus, who may only be on this call, is a member of the DRT who lives in San Antonio. And I remember where I was when she called me to suggest that the DRT chapter in Nacogdoches wanted to erect a DRT medallion marker to Trammell's Trace in Nacogdoches. I thought that was pretty cool. And then as the plans took place, what happened was their creation of this incredibly beautiful black granite marker, text on both sides, <laughs> that's erected in Bonita Creek Park uh, with the representation of the map and tales of the history uh, just an incredible uh, milestone and and what turned out you know what started out is just uh, some curious googling. So in trying to write a history and I'm, I'm sure a lot of the people on the call have done their own research in one form or another whether it's genealogical or historical is that you start with a recitation of facts, but that doesn't hold people's interest very long. And what, so what I've learned in this research and trying to tell the story is that story is absolutely essential. That's what connects us to uh, these bits of our, our past and things that happened before. It's the story. It's not the event or the date or the names of people that we don't 
know very well. It is the story that comes out of it. And sometimes story can get magnified into legend, but it's those stories that uh, connect people. So uh, there's this very complex uh, interplay uh, into something that is sometimes so deep that it really can't not be easily explained. So uh, part of the Trammell's Trace journey for me has been this connecting that story to landowners along the way. Uh, who have been happy to uh, hear about the, the history of Trammell's Trace and how it might have impacted their family and their property. Uh, and they repeat that story to others. So getting to meet people and pass along the story of Trammell's Trace is really uh, the reward and what it's all about and what tends to last and go on uh, in getting that done. I started by being a little philosophical about the road. I want to end by being uh, a bit the same way and to read a part of a poem that was the only one I know of that's written uh, as if it's first person and the road is speaking. Uh, the first instance of this poem was in French uh, at the International Road Congress in Paris in 1908, but I found it in a pivotal book by Helen Norville in 1945 about the King's Highway, El Camino Real. So the road is speaking here when it says, when I plunge into chasms and sound the deeps, climb to the plateau, mount the dizzy steeps, or when above the mountains near the skies, I spread new worlds before men's dazzled eyes. For all the gifts on you I have bestowed, be my good doctor and save Oh, save the road. So one of the downsides, that's a clearly a pivotal dramatic moment where typically uh, there would be wild and crazy applause here. I'm looking at my wife. Could you help me out? I should be, see there, there you go. <laughs> so I should have done like the uh, NBA, the NFL and had crowd noise, but this was the best I could do was this webcam look of people applauding. Did you see my webcam? So I do appreciate the chance, uh, Leanna to, uh, and Linda to uh, do the presentation. Uh, I'll be sure and let everybody know that they can uh, find that recording uh, out there as well. And I would certainly invite any of you who don't already have uh, a copy of the book as well uh, to look into that. Uh, Trammell's Trace book is $25. Uh, my second book on true believers is about the Hendricks Lake Lafitte treasure legend. Uh, Hendricks Lake is right along the edge of Trammell's Trace. That's how I discovered it. And if you buy both books, not only will I chop $5 off, if you use the checkout code free ship, you'll save the $3 shipping. So you can order those uh, and I'll get those out uh, probably too late today, but on Monday, I get those out to everybody. So uh, this is where I'll take some time off uh, and in the presentation to go with questions. I'll see if I can uh, call some of those up, Linda. Do I need to stop sharing my screen? No, you can leave it up or you can stop sharing it and then your face will be larger on here. Oh, I'd rather put this, I'll leave it with that. How's that? That's blatant commercialism, but please help me out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. So Q and A. Let's see. I think the first question we had was, um, "What is a vara?" And I did put a link from TSHA in reply to that question. But if you want to address it, uh, what is a vara? Yes. Uh, it's a Spanish measure of distance that were used in the original Texas land surveys. I think it's 3.3 something feet. Um, and so there, there's a, our conversion tools on the internet. So I enter the number of VARAs and it calculates the number of feet and I plot that on my, uh, on my mapping software. Okay. What is known about the descendants of Trammell? What is known about the descendants? A great deal. Uh, a number of them, understandably so, are, are proud to be related to somebody so well known. And 
the fact that he was an outlaw sometimes makes a few of them stick their chest out even further. Uh, <laughs> Jack Jackson, who was an incredibly gifted historian and wrote uh, many books um, about this time period, was actually a Trammell descendant. And so uh, there is a, a Jack Jackson history of his family in the uh, Gonzales County uh, Records Center and uh, Trammell descendants participate on the uh, the website as, as well as having their own. So pretty well documented uh, who the connections are. Linda, I've got a, a couple of questioners here that I want to uh, uh, deal with and pay and talk about their questions. Uh, a question from Victor Galan, who's an archaeologist in uh, in Nacogdoches. Uh, have any landowners helped you record early historic homesteads along the old route? Uh, Victor, there's, there have been a few, but uh, haven't really dug into that uh, very, very much. Uh, when I get in there, I'm looking at the road and using GPS to map it. Uh, there certainly are some uh, right along the route uh, just south of the Sabine. Uh, the Hendricks Plantation was the, uh, a recent uh, archaeological site. I don't think that report has been published yet, but incredibly substantial uh, homestead, slave quarters, outbuildings, um, you know, early 1800s uh, in there. Another question is from uh, Light Cummins, who if there is a Mount Rushmore of Texas history, uh, Dr. Cummins uh, face is prominently displayed on it. Uh, my question is motivated by the ruts which endure as landscape features. It seems these must have been uh, in order to survive erosion weathering made by very heavy traffic, including large wagons with significant cargo weights. Do you have any figures about the volume of traffic along the trace at this time? Uh, it's interesting uh, because there is so much variation in the depth and width of the ruts. Uh, Jeff Williams uh, at Stephen F. Austin uh, University did his master's thesis uh, uh, and created a typology of those road ruts on the El Camino Real. Uh, east of Nacogdoches at Lobanillo Swales. I would encourage any Texan to go visit that site. Uh, I get chill bumps talking about it now, but when you see it, you'll understand it is the most incredible uh, road rut feature that I know of. Uh, soil uh, type and terrain makes a difference. Uh, certainly cultivation and other things uh, make a difference. Uh, Jeff's typology uh, make some estimates or give some reasons for why the road shapes and widths are what they are. And uh, Dr. Cummins, there are some, I, I do have in the book some uh, numbers about migration south, particularly during uh, Austin's, uh, the, the immigration to Austin's colony uh, and into the thousands. I can't quote you a figure right now, but uh, I'm honored that you're on and that you ask a question. Uh, Barbara Stevens, who, uh, Barbara, when we met, you were, were president of the Daughters Republic of Texas, uh, had a question. If you were traveling from Nashville to Pecan Point in 1817, would you use Trammell's Trace and the Spanish Trace or the Red River? Uh, strangely, when you, when you see the whole map, the most direct route after you cross the Red River is to head south down through uh, across Epperson's Ferry and down through East Texas. But when the earliest settlers uh, from Tennessee came to the Red River, they settled far upstream from there at Pecan Point. And it's way out of the way if your plan is to come to Texas. But if you're joining up with other Tennesseans at a Buffalo crossing where Buffalo were known to cross three times a year, and there was much uh, Indian trade to be had, that's where the settlement was. So they far uh, would travel far to the west and uh, into Pecan Point and would have come down that trail that Trammell was credited with widening. Uh, I think once the Pecan Point uh, evictions, as Austin called it, uh, took place and that settlement became less important, then it was the, the eastern fork of Trammell's Trace that it would have been a, uh, been more used. Um, let's see here. Linda, you have another one that you picked up on? Uh, yes. 
how can you be assured that the ruts are not caused by other events? And a lot of times they are caused by other events. The, the, what makes me certain that they are part of Trammell's Trace is the mapping that I'm able to do based on the known uh, points from the surveys. Without the surveys, it would just be a wild guess. And there are, once you attune your eyes to see <laughs> ruts like these, they're all over the place. I mean, go look on the, uh, I think the Center for Texas History has some, uh, I, I found highway maps as early as the, the 1930s and there are county roads everywhere. Um, Topo View uh, is a uh, USGS website that lets you overlay those old uh, topos and old uh, soil maps and uh, uh, old resources like that, they let you overlay them on current maps. And so I visited one landowner in Cass County uh, thinking that we might see Trammell's Trace and those old county maps told us that no, it was a later uh, county road. So it's the, the certainty comes from the, the terrain between two points and following it uh, uh, along the path that the, the, the landscape provides. Okay, um, another question is about when did people stop using the trace? Well, that's interesting because um, the first acts of counties when they were formed were to appoint road overseers and designate people to maintain sections of, of roads. Uh, Nicholas Trammell was famously fined one dollar for not appearing uh, to uh, support his part of the, of the roads in Arkansas when he was about 60 years old. It just made me laugh. But in Russ County, up into the 1850s, uh, 56, 57, I think, road overseers were appointed to keep clear the road between, uh, to, to keep clean Trammell's Trace, they named it between Mount Enterprise, which is where our farm is, and the Sink Springs. The Sink Springs, uh, I haven't been able to verify, but there's a, an incredible candidate for the Sink Springs, just east of the cemetery where my grandparents are buried. This is a spring that comes out of a bank that probably goes down about 60 or 70 feet to a lignite base where the spring trickles out. and. It's an incredible land feature uh, that's been there a long time. And I'm sure that's the road that they maintained was from Man Enterprise to the cemetery at Shiloh Baptist Church, essentially. But that was being done up until the 1850s. There's an 1863 map of uh, uh, Russ, Panola, Harrison County, Sabine area that from Civil War times. And it's on the website or it's on the Facebook group that shows by that time, roads were going everywhere. I mean, roads were built between actual destinations when Trammell's Trace was was not based on any destination other than Nacogdoches. Uh, so it's with a fair amount of certainty, you learn which ruts to ignore and which ones have uh, some merit in history. Um, Larry Horton asked, I'm researching early East Texas Native Americans. Do you plan on doing older research since this was a major major Cadawan path connecting their empire. I'm glad you asked because that book I'm working on right now is about Spanish East Texas. Um, I'm really looking at a period between 1770 and 1813 or so, uh, roughly between when uh, the people in Los Adais were evicted and forced to go to Bear and settled Bucareli, uh, Trinidad, west of Nacogdoches on the Trinity. And this time period uh, with Gilly Barvo, uh, this time period where there was a fairly cozy economic relationship among Spanish, French, and Indian. And then uh, the Mexican Revolution began to foment and filibusters from the United States came to come in and kind of mess things up. Uh, it started to, the tension started to create it. So I'm, I'm looking at a period before that. and. Uh, yes, focusing on, uh, you know, where the Caddo settlements might have been, some 
roads uh, looking at the, the, the space between the Sabine and the Trinity River, roads going south from there, and uh, uh, the Bidai Trail, uh, Contraband Road, and some other roads uh, into there. So part of the lead up into that is uh, uh, some research and some discussion of the early missions and the uh, Indians, the, the Caddo and the Bidai, especially, who were present during that time period. Uh, Car Caroline Krim says, have you discovered the location of Bucarelli? That is, I believe, undiscoverable. <laughs> Same goes for Trinidad. Uh, Spanish diary accounts uh, send you all over the map. Uh, Bob Skiles is a retired uh, archaeologist with the General Land Office who's researched this heavily, along with my collaborator on the book, Tom Gann. And I'm placing Bucarelli at the end of Wilson Shoals Road. Uh, and you can look that up on a map on the southwest side of, of uh, tr the Trinity where Bidai Creek uh, comes into uh, the Trinity. That's a good place to drive and get a real sense of history. The shoals were on the Trinity there. And in the book, I'll have descriptions of that and some of the early geography. It's a very cool place. One of the places that I'm sending people to go see uh, in this book. Uh, my brother, Danny, thanks for joining, Danny. Uh, ask, have you ever found any tree carvings or initials dived into trees along the trail? I get questions like that often, that, you know, that, oh, it'd be cool to be do some metal detecting. Uh, and it probably would. Uh, the trail's 180 miles long. And uh, I just haven't found a place to do anything significant uh, like that. Um, there are certainly were marks along the trees, uh, blazes that would send people on the route. In the book, I talk about how, uh, particularly on the Arkansas, uh, people would put marks on trees leading travelers toward their way where they would, you know, charge them for dinner and an overnight stay. Uh, but it would also get them off the main road. Uh, but blazes have certainly been, but I just don't see anything that, that has survived. I'm also one of the, the major doubters on um, the, the stories that go around about Indian trees being bent over to guide people on the trail. And when pictures of many of the trees I see are, you know, not quite 30 or 40 years old, it kind of lead you to understand that was probably a significant freeze that bent that poor little tree over like that. But uh, no marks, no blazes, uh, no metal detecting that I've done, uh, but uh, certainly a lot of history. Gary, we've got a couple of uh, earlier questions I want to make sure we get back to. Um, we have uh, Paula, who says she's a descendant of the Burleson family and a very serious researcher. Um, are you familiar with General Ed Burleson and the family? And it, it, she thinks it's very possible that the Burleson family follow Trammell's trace. Do you have a list of settlers in Rusk? Oh, Paula, <laughs> I do know uh, the, when you say Burleson, I think there, the trace went through a Burleson survey. If you if you found that my my email uh, is available on the opening slide. And if there's also a way to contact me through Trammell's Trace, so please contact me afterwards uh, personally so we can go over that. But I'm, I'm remembering a Burleson survey and, uh, you know, my parents both were born in Rusk County in Mount Enterprise. And even though I grew up in Longview, I, I would pick Rusk as my home county. So I do have a lot of information about folks in Rusk County and certainly put you in touch with others who will know even more. So uh, please, please reach out and contact me and we can go into that in greater detail. I've got one other uh, question that um, involves uncertain. Uh, have you found a lot of little outbuildings near Uncertain uh, that were moved <laughs> and used in a movie back in the 1980s? Some they only took 
the front of the building and other times they move the entire structure. Well, I, that uncertain is a little far to the east for my purposes on this project. I've, I've been there many times and I, I have to say I didn't that my only experience with buildings like that would have been that in the in the part of the trace that was destroyed south of the Sabine along the county line, somebody had erected a, a two story outhouse. And if you've ever seen those internet pictures of two story outhouses, you know that there's not a lot of practical use of that upper story. I'm not sure what that's for, but no, I have not been um, been involved with any of the buildings uh, in uncertain. Okay, and I have one one last question. I want to be sure we get to, um, and that is uh, uh, Nancy, who says her ancestor came to Nacogdoches in 1836 from Benton County, Arkansas. Uh, went on to become a commissioner for Cherokee County. Uh, would he most likely have traveled down Trammell's Trace? At that time, it's still pretty pretty likely. Um, anyone coming down through Fulton and the Red River area. Uh, would have touched the road. There were options to get south from Fulton on the United States side of the Sabine. And that slide I showed earlier where the commenter said Trammell's Trace was a far better road from Fulton than it was to go south through, through Louisiana. Uh, so they had a decision to make. And I think a lot of time, uh, there was a, a, a lot of times people made the decision when they got to Fulton uh, about which route they would take. I just have to, to, to read uh, uh, Dr. James Harris, whose picture I, I used in the, uh, he was sitting in the four footer with a big smile on his face. Dr. Harris went in his sense of humor that I love says that your map now shows the trace going through my living room in Harrison County just before crossing 59, which it does. Uh, I want to let you know that there's not much traffic lately. So that's the update from Dr. Harris <laughs> south of Marshall. Thank you, Jim, for that. I appreciate that very much. <laughs> um, I, I see that one of our, our questions in the chat is actually a question that I had too. And, and if that is, if you would talk about how to visit uh, some of the trace locations uh, legally, I want to be sure and, and specify legally, because I know a lot of these locations that you may have pictured here are on private property, and we don't want to encourage anyone to try to access anything that's on private land. But there's, if there are some places, and I know you have that Google map on your website, maybe you can direct us to some places to see it. You, you have struck me, uh, you've struck a nerve there because that's been one of those things that are on my list I've been meaning to do because there are, um, there are four or five good spots. They're scattered about, so it depends on how committed people are to driving through beautiful East Texas. Uh, but to me, when the leaves leave, uh, it's a great time to go because it's much easier to see ruts and when the, all the undergrowth is gone. So I, I think this is a great time up until when the dogwoods bloom uh, to drive East Texas, but I will, I'll commit to doing that and I'll, I'll put it on the Facebook group when I do. I've actually gotten it started for one, one guy who was committed to a trip and there's, there, there are several places where you can see visible ruts like the ones I showed you in the, some of the slides. Great. Yeah. Well, I that wanted to know if you searched for any writing, letters, journals by travelers on the trace. Yeah, there are a few that I that I use in the book, um, and I, I love those. I mean, those first person accounts are incredibly valuable. Uh, one of them talked about on the journey to uh, Arkansas, they had to cross the Great Mississippi Swamp, and and for five or six miles walking through water up to their waist. Um, one account talked about a section of trail where they had to ride the horse as fast as they could to avoid being overcome by horse flies, essentially. Uh, 
one letter back from a family who ended up settling near Marshall cautioned their family back home not to let Mr. So-and-so build their wagon because the one that he built for them had fallen apart <laughs> on the way down the trail. Uh, those personal stories are incredible. I, you know, I, any historian lives for those um, to get those personal accounts like that. Is that it? Uh, well, I see there there one more that I don't think we've addressed, and that is if you wanted to see the connection of the road all the way up into Missouri, um, as various feeder lines came into Trammell's Trace, where uh, where would you go to to look into that information? There is in uh, in Arkansas there. The websites have come and gone as as far as being focused on the Southwest Trail. There's, if you look now, you'll find that part of the Southwest Trail is being turned into a hike and bike trail, which is pretty cool. How, how closely it follows the military roads, I don't know. Uh, the Southwest uh, Arkansas Regional Archive in Washington, Arkansas has a drawer full of wonderful maps of that area. The David Rumsey uh, map collection online is a great uh, resource for looking at some of those old maps. Um, if somebody has a, spe a specific interest, I've I've got an incredible amount of stuff here that I'd be happy to to share if you want to email me with a specific question. But um, you know, I, I would start with Rumsey uh, David Rumsey uh, map collection and then uh, contact uh, Melissa Nesbitt at, at Sarah to, uh, to, to fill in any, any specifics that you might have. Um, one other uh, archival question uh, in a follow-up, did you find any archival connection between Trammell and his contemporary, the quote, great land pirate, uh, John A. Murrell? No, that was one of those, <laughs> things I found uh, propagated out there early on in the uh, research. As much as I tried to follow it, I couldn't find anything to verify that. Um, there's always been this association between Trammell and Lafitte. And uh, Lafitte made his way up into Arkansas on a, a bit of an inspection and may have used some of that route uh, as well. And in that same region, uh, there weren't that many people. So they encountered a lot of others. The most interesting long-term connection that I've been able to track without having an aha moment is the constant overlap between Chief Bowles of the Cherokee and Nicholas Trammell. Um, the, when Trammell settled in northeastern Arkansas, Missouri Territory at the time. The Cherokee were the far more civilized inhabitants of that area. Had a lot of complaints about the Anglos and, and rightly so. But as you follow Bolts and Trammell over time, they're in the same areas uh, at the same time. But nothing I found that documented that overlap uh, between them. Uh, so I, I don't I don't find anything documented to support that Nicholas Trammell was some outlaw or criminal. Uh, he would sue you to the ends of the earth for a hundred dollars. And one Arkansas case uh, went through six or seven different judges and some of whom had to recuse themselves because they had been his attorney when they started the lawsuit. Uh, but he would not let people off for anything. He was going to be right uh, in the end and uh, no real criminal charges. Uh, a lot of lawsuits as there were in those days for uh, unpaid debts and things like that. Uh, one other researcher tends to believe that Trammell was a bit of an evil slave owner, but his take on a, an account of Trammell and a slave is, and mine are different in that I read it that Trammell showed some mercy to a slave that was being held in chains. And so I, I go with that firsthand description of Trammell being the guy that, 
you know, he's a nice guy, but don't leave him alone in your house. <laughs> he was an opportunist. That's the way I describe it. And Gary, I don't know if we've covered this or not, but do you have an estimate of how many people may have traveled the road over the course of its lifespan? Uh, I, I can't remember. I do cover some numbers, available numbers in the book that showed accounts from Arkansas on how many people were passing by heading south during the uh, Austin colony years. I, I don't recall those numbers exactly, but it would be uh, it would be in the thousands. And the greatest use was during that time period, just before and after the colony, and then again after. Texas became a republic and uh, people began entering uh, Texas uh, after, it after it became uh, a republic. And so uh, that's when the explosion of growth and all the explosion of other roads began to take place as people nailed down settlements and, you know, making a path through the woods, which is qu qualified for a road. We have to quit thinking of a road as something that has clear boundaries and drainage and and edges on it and the trees arc over it in a nice you know east texas road kind of way it's just a path through woods that were much more open and much more clearer than they are now there wasn't a lot of the undergrowth and and uh you know the understory clogging things up the way they were so to make a quote road from point a to point b wasn't that you know hugely difficult um you know, I mentioned early county activities around roads. There's a, a great um, stipulation by the Russ County commissioners where they define how tall stumps can be in the middle of the road. And so a, a good improved road in the 1840s uh, made sure based on the diameter of the tree, how tall the stump could be. And they, they all had to be shorter than the axle of a wagon, but one personal account that I found, you know, talks about crossing a road and how dangerous it was. And you don't, you hope you don't bump your knee or fall to your certain death, you know, trying to cross these roads. Well, and Gary, that's an excellent segue into our next question, which was what dangers did people encounter on the roads? And obviously general road hazards are one of them. It certainly would be in there. Uh, uh, in the book, I talk about an area s south of what's now Marshall that became to be called Bloody Prairie. Uh, there were some um, Indian uh, kidnappings in that uh, in that area, and uh, some people murdered uh, in that stretch between Marshall. Marshall wasn't there, but between uh, that part of Harris County and the Sabine. And one uh, fairly detailed account of two men coming up, up upon a body that they found right along the Sabine River from somebody who'd been murdered for their horse and rifle. And the, the men uh, tracked, tracked the thieves and murderers down and hauled them down to Nacogdoches uh, for justice. So uh, one other personal account uh, talked about, and this is probably early 1820s, uh, a man coming down from Pecan Point along the trace and being shot uh, with an arrow in the leg and all the way back to Pecan Point uh, past not a single soul over, you know, 150 or so miles of road. So we, we really have to adjust our thinking to understand the, the wildness and the, mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, lack of real civilization, even the Indian settlements along the route would have been off the road on a side trail, not, uh, you know, not like a roadside stop. Um, so pr pretty private, pretty quiet. Um, I've never heard a panther scream in the night, but I've heard wolves howl. And if you're in the middle of the woods and it's dark, uh, it'll get the hair on the back of your neck up for sure. Well, I believe that is our last question. So I am going to rejoin you on video and uh, 
I have a couple of uh, announcements to make as we conclude, and Linda may as well. Uh, I just want to thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, remind you that if you tuned in late and missed the first portion, you can always watch it on the library's YouTube channel. Uh, the link to that is available in the chat. I also want to encourage everybody to pick up a copy of Gary's book. Uh, you saw the link on his uh, page there. I also put the link in the chat. Uh, for everybody, because uh, obviously this is a, an incredibly interesting story um, with lots of different facets to it. Uh, and I want to remind everyone to join us in uh, February on the 6th when we welcome Tawana uh, Stepto to talk about African American research and resources. So uh, with that, I, I just want to say thanks again for spending your Saturday morning with us and uh, turn it over to Linda for any other final comments. I thank everybody for being with us today, and that's it. Thank okay, you. Okay, well, thank you, Gary. This was a, a fascinating program. We You're really welcome. Appreciate I appreciate, it. appreciate the opportunity. Okay. We'll see everybody next time then. Bye now.